welcome back to service this week. I hope your week has been well. Let us commit this time unto the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Father, we just want to commit this time into your hands. And Lord, we pray for whoever that's watching this right now. Lord Father, may your presence be made so apparent in our lives, wherever we are. And Lord, today we pray that even as we make room and make space, for the things that are important to us. Lord, today we will also learn to surrender our time into your hands, to make way and make room for your presence, to make way and make room for you to do what only you can do. So Lord Father, we just want to commit this time into your hands. And Lord, we pray that you will enjoy this offering of praise unto you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing this is my surrender This is my surrender This is where I lay it down You are all I'm chasing now This is my surrender This is my surrender Shalom. Brothers and sisters and friends, welcome to our Sunday morning English service uh, worship. We thank you for joining us this morning and I trust that the Lord will take you through a wonderful time of uh, fellowship with Him and sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now two weeks ago we had Brother Chris Lian to share with us that uh, wherever God has placed us we are to serve Him and the Lord will give us opportunities to serve Him. And last week, Pastor Claire reminded us that we who are believers in Christ Jesus, we have a role to play in God's kingdom here on earth. Now, the both of them gave us their sermon and their sharing, and with an expectation that we who are listeners are already bound to God in Christ Jesus. But this morning, I have a question. What if a person who is listening does not have God in his equation? does not have the reality of God in his life? What if his understanding of life is this horizontal, earthly perspective of life? And if that is so, then whatever Chris or whatever Pastor Claire has spoken has holds no meaning for such a person. In the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer sketches the picture of such a person, such a man. Now over the next few sessions, a few sermons that I will share with you, I hope to unpack some of these thoughts from the book of Ecclesiastes about how man looks at life through lenses which is an earthly human point of view. And perhaps for some of us, we will be able to see identify ourselves with those pathways that such a man takes. So let us pray and let us trust God that He will lead us and guide us through this exploration. Our Heavenly Father, what we know not, teach us. And what we have not, give us. And what we are not, make us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Before we go into Ecclesiastes, uh, looking at the book, let's take a look at who the writer is. The Bible begins the first line in verse verse it says the words of the teacher son of David king of in Jerusalem the word teacher here in Hebrew is Kohalath it is the word that says he is a an assembler a preacher he is one who assembles the people and then he shares and talks to them wisdom words now the the way it is written the style it is written Many scholars attribute it to Solomon. And on top of that, he says he is the son of David, he is king of Jerusalem. And there is so much wisdom in the whole of Ecclesiastes. So let us take the writer to be Solomon, the son of David. And why he is? Because when he became king, God asked him, what would you like me to give you, bestow upon you? And Solomon did not ask for riches or gold. He asked God for wisdom. And that is found in 1 Kings 3. And indeed, in 1 Kings chapter 4, and I'm going to read to you 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 to 34, we begin to see a description of how wise Solomon was. 
Verse 29 says, God gives Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the East and greater than all of the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man, including Ethan, the Ezrahite, wiser than Haman, Kakol, and Dada, the sons of Mahol. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He described plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the high sops that grow out of the walls. He also taught about the animals and the birds and reptiles and fish. The men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. The Solomon was so wise, he was so brilliant, he had intimate knowledge of anything that he shared. You know, it was so, so specific. He could talk about the cedars of Lebanon, the trees, the bark, the leaves. He could talk about the high sops in the you know, growing out from the walls. He could talk about the animals and the birds. You know, maybe sitting at his feet is like listening to, you know, we can't watch maybe, but listening to National Geographic or BBC Nature World. He was so wise, so much so that men from all over the world came, sent by kings to listen to his wisdom. And so, what was it that uh, he wanted out of this book called Ecclesiastes? What was Solomon trying to achieve you know, using the wisdom that he had? And to know that, we can discover it in verse 12 and 13. And he says this, he says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. In other words, what he was trying to do in this whole of Ecclesiastes is this. That phrase, under heaven, connotes one thing. That it is wisdom apart from God. Life apart from God. In other words, life on this earth without a reference to God. Men living without God. How is the view of man without God on this earth? And he began to explore, he searched and he, he sought after what meant to be the wisdom and the life of a purely human thinking, a purely human perspective apart from God. And so he begins to write. Now, the phrase, as I said to you under the sun, is it is found 29 times uh, in the whole of Ecclesiastes. And that tells us this whole book is seen from the perspective, not from God, but from an earthly perspective. Let us then begin. And in the beginning, let's take a look at what Solomon did. You know, if I want to make an, a, a, an argument, if I want to make a, a statement, I would normally do share my observations, share my arguments first, and then I do a conclusion. That's a, that's a basic thing for all of us, if we want to make a statement in life. But Solomon was different. Instead of placing the arguments and the obser observations in front, he started off with his conclusion. And what was his conclusion? It's found in verse 2. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. In the King James Version, what I've read is NIV, but in the King James Version, the word is vanity. It means futility. It means uselessness, completely useless. And that conclusion is so clear and so absolute. It's as though once you say the word meaningless, it is this exclamation and a full stop. That's his conclusion. That life on earth here without God, apart from God, is meaningless. And this is really the pursuit of the whole of Ecclesiastes. Because it is found in verse 3. He puts as a question, What does man gain from all his labor, at which he tolls under the sun? You see the phrase under the sun again. Being apart from God, what is life all about? What does man gain by hard work that he puts in every day? 
and then Solomon begins to draw out a pattern of life that perhaps all men all men goes through unless he has God in his revelation he has God in his equation of life so what is this common thing or common pattern of life that is on this earth it is found in verse 4 to verse 8 let me read generation come verse 4 generations come and generations go but the earth remains forever the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises the wind blows to the north to the south and turns to the north round and round it goes ever returning on its course all streams flow into the sea yet the sea never is never full you know verse 7 is so interesting isn't it have you ever thought about it though the rivers keep flowing into the sea but the sea never kind of built up you know it never overflows but it remains where it is the reason is very simple to the place where the streams came from there they return again and in verse 8 he says this all things are wearisome more than one can say the eye has never enough of seeing nor the ear is full of is filled of hearing you know this is what solomon in his first observation that he says contributes to the meaninglessness of life it is the weariness of being on this earth the monotony of this earth life just goes on in a circle it's like a circle game solomon recognizes this and he it, he says that it brings to his soul an emptiness it is there's a lack of purpose you know there's a lack of meaning what does he mean verse 4 says this generation comes generation goes every single day babies are born men women dies yet the world keeps turning and spinning and nothing changes a person dies so it doesn't matter and yet life goes on every day the earth spins on every day and verse 5 he says that look the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises and it doesn't stop you know we we will wake up because the sun is up and when we wake up we will look at oh it's another day what is another day it's cleaning up going to work taking a train in the crowd sometimes and then it's lunch time it is work again it is tea break it is work again and then it's time to go off for home and it's dinner it is playing with the children if you have children if not it is the internet it is the tv and then after that you will shut off and tomorrow morning it's another morning again and the cycle goes on it's a circle of life and what's what's worse is that many of us does what is in verse 16 chasing after the wind he says that this is how the wind blows to the south and then it turns to the north and then round and round it goes like ever returning on his course and if we are sucked into it you know we are chasing after the wind there are many things in life that we seem to chase after but we could never be in reach of it i remember when i was uh, helping a friend to hit hunt for uh, private bankers a young man sat in front of me 26 27 years old and i looked at him and i said okay so what are your what are your goals he said and he looked at me and says i want to make my first million dollars by the time i'm 30 I said, wow, that's a good goal. And then I asked him, after that, what's after that? And he thought for a while and he said, maybe by 35, my next million. And then I asked him, okay, and then after that. And he sat there for a long while thinking. And there's not, there seems to be nothing else except to make one million after that. It's, it's chasing after the wind. There is no satisfaction. In fact, verse 8, verse 8 says this, the meaning, meaninglessness is too much even to talk about. Life limited to this earth and under the sun is ultimately dissatisfaction. No matter how much a man sees, he wants to see more. No matter how much he hears, he wants more. He is always wanting more, never satisfied. And this is a testimony for many people under the sun, devoid of God devoid of the revelation of God in his life. I have never heard of, and I don't think you have ever heard of, a millionaire telling you, oh, I've got enough money, you know. Because if we have 
if there were a millionaire who tells you, oh, I, I have enough money, we would not have billionaires. A billionaire today want to be trillionaires. Many of us, my friends, before we had God in our lives, were like that too, chasing after the wind because we want to be satisfied. I want satisfaction. Could it be that we were born with an inner desire and a hunger to be satisfied? But in this fallen world, my friends, we can never truly be satisfied because nothing will satisfy us. In the weariness of being on this earth begins to wear the soul. And tired souls give up living. And how do we find ways of giving up living? Isolation is one. Pack up my bags, leave my family, walk on the streets now. No cares of the world. It's okay to leave hand to mouth, but who cares? Because it's just no meaning in anything. I mean, they shall live truly a meaningless life. And in Japan, the hikikomori, the men and women who are recluses, you know, more men than women apparently, who are recluses, who withdraw from society, who get away from social contact and very often only get out of their houses once in, in many years. And if that is not enough, then let's go and find a high. Let's go and find something that gives us a trip. Drugs, alcohol, online gaming where I can maybe take another person's role. A general in the army, a soldier, a fighter. Engage in extreme sports where the adrenaline gets me pumping and I get a high. Climb onto a high tower or a high building. Walk at its edge. Take a, a selfie. And if I fall and die, so be it. But I've got my high. I've got my adrenaline pumping. And if that's, that's down and I, I've come down and that's not enough, I look for the next challenge and the next challenge and the next challenge. And if, un, if unable to find a satisfaction in that way, the ultimate trip is death. From which no one comes back. And so, Solomon discovers the first observation that leads to meaninglessness. And that is that it is wearisome to have life on this earth. But he has a second observation that tells that life being apart from God is meaningless. And that is found in verse 9 and 10. It says here, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, Look, there is something new. It was there. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. Second observation really is this. this there is nothing new under the sun. History constantly repeats after itself. Life is a cycle. No one learns from it. It goes round and round like Ferris wheels going, going really nowhere. Maybe it comes back, but it's presented in a different form. That's about it. You know, friends, we, we tend to think that we, we live in an enlightened age where we are smarter than the people who came before us. But I think the opposite is the reality. The reality is that we are a lot dumber because I figure out that people of the past, people who came before us were deep thinkers. And today, not many of us are deep thinkers. You know, a lot of people rush and, and join protests and, and they, 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 you know, they are up front there and they are fighting with, the, with authorities and all that. But very few of them understand what, is, what are the subject matter? What are they protesting about? The late uh, David Pawson uh, had a little story. One day he was supposed to go to a university to give a talk and he was stopped uh, along the way because there was a protest going on. So he just stood there. And when the protest was over, suddenly a young man ran towards him and says, You know, where's the protest? Where's everybody? Oh, oh no, I'm late. Anyway, what was the protest all about? You know, the man... The young man did not even know what the protest was all about. All he wanted to do was, I'll come and I join. Without thinking. 
Now, before you think that I am just shooting my mouth off at everyone else, I am speaking to myself too. I wish I had more time and wish I had more commitment to sit down and do a lot more deep thinking about life and about life after. And so, my friends, even as we do so, we realize that our, our thinking processes are superficial. And indeed, as Solomon has said, there's nothing really new. But you say, Pastor, wait a little minute. What about airplanes? Solomon n- never saw airplanes. He, in fact, he never saw a computer. Let me just tell you this. These are slants of all realities. Before we flew in airplanes, birds flew. Many, 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 many thousands of years ago, birds flew. God created them. They could flap their wings. And for us, can I ask you this question? Do you think we really fly? Or are we just sitting in a tube where there are two protruding wings on the left and the right and and they are powered by engines and we don't flap our wings? Do you really fly? Birds really fly? They flap their wings. So it is just a rearrangement. Uh, What about the internet? It's just a rearrangement. It is about communication. It is about information. How we retrieve information. How we store information. Nothing new. But just a rearrangement. A redesign. And that's all that is. And I like fashion. You know, one day I wanted to buy a pair of pants and I went to this shop and I looked at this pair of pants. It looked quite nice. And then the lady came to me and this shop assistant and she looked at me and said you can't wear this I said why this is for skinny pants these are skinny pants for skinny people and obviously I don't look skinny and I really looked at it the label says skinny pants they are pants which kind of taper to the end in this little skinny tube and we all think that wow today this is fashionable for us who think that this is fashion I want you to try and look for movies in the 50s and the 60s. 60s. Look at James Dean. Look at Elvis Presley. They were already wearing those tube skinny pants. So let me advise you. Keep your pants after they've gone out of fashion. And uh, let your grandchildren inherit them. Because they could be having that fashion then. But on a more serious note, my friends, the cycle of evil still continues. Evil has never escaped. And in fact, man with all of his intelligence has become more and more evil. And we think of new ways of destroying people. We used to destroy people one on one and then a few tens and the hundreds. And ever since the atomic atomic bomb invented by brilliant men and women, we can destroy tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. We can wipe out cities and nations. You know, it just looks different. But it's all the same. There's nothing new under the sun. And in fact, not only is there nothing new under the sun, in verse 11, Solomon observes this too, that not only is there a cycle of life, and when the cycle passes It looks as though there's no remembrance, especially there's no remembrance about us under the sun, apart from God. You know, we have to admit it that we will be forgotten. I mean, I ask you this question. How many of us remember or know our great-grandfather's name? And and what about information about our great-grandfather? I don't know my great-grandfather's name, but I know of him, an, an incident. He came from China. And he was in Singapore for a while. And I don't know what he did. He was deported by the authorities and then he was sent back to China. That's all I know. Question about it is, is there truth to it? I don't know. So in other words, we are forgotten. Just like my great-grandfather is forgotten. It, it, the strange thing about it is this. It is not very long in terms of, it, you know, if you reflect in terms of the lifetime, life timeline of history about a person's life we forget now this is life under the sun when life is over and when death comes along it is over the individual just signals the end this is my friends a world view a worldly view a life one moment gone in the next last breath but I want to take an aside here that with God it is different if God is in your equation For those of us who believe in God, 
through Jesus Christ dwelling in God. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, says this, death is not the end but the beginning of a new, a greater, a more complete everlasting life. Not the end, not forgotten. You are remembered. You are remembered by God. But for those living under the sun, apart from God, apart from the revelation of God, life is like a candle in the wind. You have heard the song before, isn't it? But what does candle in the wind mean? It is something that is particularly vulnerable, weak, fragile, that is precarious and it is easy to perish and eliminate it at any moment. And it is gone. And death means being forgotten. And so, what so then is life like for man? You know, Solomon continues to write in verse 14, and this is what he says in verse 14. He says that, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, uh, chasing after the wind. It's like a dog chasing after its, after its own tail. The, you can never reach that. It is such a frustration. It is meaningless. And even... Even in verse 15, he says this, It is an endless puzzle. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. It is an endless puzzle. And that is life apart from God. Life without God in the equation. So two observations that leads to the meaninglessness of life. One, and that is life it's wearisome to live life on this earth. And number two, that there's nothing new on this earth. And number three, what is it? And this is found in verses 16 to 18. Let me just read that for you. Verses 16 says, verse 16 says, I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is like chasing after the wind. Verse 18, For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. What is his third observation? His third observation is this. Even in wisdom, in the quest for wisdom and knowledge, if there is no reality in God, it is meaningless. And not only it is, is it meaningless, it is sorrowful. It is painful. You know, we live in Singapore. We, we are a culture of people who really value education. And we want our young people to be educated as much as we can. But to be educated for what? Because Solomon in all of his wisdom says that it is also meaningless. If God is not in the picture. Verse 17, he says this, he knows that he has much wisdom. I mean, this guy, if you can say that he's proud, he's proud. But sometimes he knows the reality. In this verse, in verse 17, he, he says that he's a great thinker. He set his heart to understand human wisdom and to apply wisdom to life. But not only did he sought for wisdom, he also sought to know what is foolishness and what is madness, insanity. Because you know, he wants to know whether there is truly meaning of life across the whole spectrum from foolishness and insanity to a, a, a huge amount of wisdom. And in some sense, perhaps, you know, the fool may be the smartest person on this planet or the insane person better and wiser than the wisest. And he found no answer. Because he found, in verse 18 says, he, con he concludes that wisdom, knowledge itself brings grief. You know, we always say this, the world is our oyster and knowledge is that path or that, that, that thing that helps us to open up our oyster. But Solomon testifies that the more we know, the more the world looks at hopelessness. We are hopeless. We look at the environment and they know, oh, suddenly we know that is there something wrong in the environment? And then we are perturbed. We look at wars, we are perturbed. We look at destruction, we are perturbed. We hear of weapons of mass destruction. We are, we, are, we are sick to the core. We hear of violence, we hear of diseases. We are, that word there in the, old, in, 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 in the King James Version says, we are vexed. 
we are confused, bewildered, we are grieved. In fact, sometimes, if I hear the tone here, maybe Solomon is trying to tell us, ignorance is bliss. He contrasts that by saying that wisdom does not bring clarity, in fact, it brings sorrow. I, have, I had a friend of mine, I used the word had because he has passed on to God's glory. A very brilliant man. But you know what was his biggest frustration? His biggest frustration is that, you know, he says, John, I know everything about medicine. But I just can't, I just can't heal myself. I can't cure myself. And that is the frustration. That means to him, all of his medical learning is meaningless to him. And so we have come to the end of chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. And these are the three observations that Solomon had, that he says contributes to meaninglessness of life on earth without God. His first observation is that it is weary to be on this earth because you know it keeps going on again the same thing again the same thing again a weariness of the soul too and second observation is that there's nothing new under the sun let's not kid ourselves and the third observation is this that even in wisdom even in the pursuit of wisdom enough knowledge it is meaningless as long as we do not have a reference called God it is sorrowful it is painful. I want to ask this question. Do you think that Christians, believers in Christ Jesus, can also be chasing after the wind? Can a Christian, one who believes in Jesus, find life meaningless? Can a believer be challenged to see beyond the sun? In other words, to look up to God. I think a good check for us, a good test for us will be what are your thoughts as you wake up each morning? And I want to put it to you that how we respond will depend on whether God is or is not in the equation of our life. We can wake up and say, Oh, another day. Or we could wake up and say, Oh wow, another day, another opportunity God has given to me for His purpose and His meaning. But friends, we can be delusional. We can, by our mouths, proclaim Christ, but in our hearts, we are not there with Him. Where Jesus Christ and God are not the center of it all. We sing a song, Jesus be the center of it all, but is He honestly the center of your life? And mine? Maybe let me just take some mathematics terminology. Jesus Christ, let me say, does not want to be a factor in your life's equation. He wants to be the equation. He wants to be the focus, the center of it all, of all the interests of all your life. He wants to give you meaning and purpose, not of an earthly measure, but of an eternal value. The psalmist writes in Psalm 26 2, he says that, Test me, Lord, and try me, examine my heart and my mind. And maybe we should take time to test and ask God, God, where am I with you? And if there is a time that where we find it looks so meaningless, maybe that's the time we realize that, God, we are not really there with you. You are not the center. Our eyes are still under the sun. And we have a void that we need to be filled. And only, you know, God can fill. You know, you have heard that a God-sized void that can only be filled by God. And I, I hope that all of us do this each day. Psalms 42, 2 says this, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with you? And so I say to all of us, let this be our theme. Maybe for this one whole week. Let this be our song. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And then we can find in Him meaning, purpose, value, eternal. Today I want to pray for two groups of people. Pray with two groups of people. 
One, uh, those of us who profess and say that Jesus, I believe in you, but yet we find that life seems to be meaningless. We seem to be going through one cycle after cycle and all going a circle again and again. And we find it so difficult to break out. And we hear and we speak of words like depression. Mentally tired. I want to pray alongside with you because I know and I believe that God is the God who fills the void. And He is the one who will water your thirst. And you will find meaning, purpose and eternal eternal view, eternal focus even here on earth with Him. So let us pray. Just close your eyes. If you are that person, just reach out to the Lord and just pray alongside with me. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for Solomon, such wisdom that you pour on him. And even as he took uh, aside for a moment, not looking the world through your eyes, through your wisdom, but through the eyes of men who, who look at a perspective from under the sun, devoid of you, and to see how meaningless life is without you. How devoid of purpose. And so God, I pray for us, those of us right now, who find, who are, who are your children, who call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, that Lord, we are able to say that life is not only, not meaningless, but full of meaning, of purpose, of eternity. And that we can live that here on earth. I pray against every depression, I pray against every every thought of of pain and 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 giving up life. And I pray God that you by your spirit come alongside my brothers and my sisters and show them show them that there is fullness of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now I want to pray for those of us you have yet to know God as your your God and Jesus as your Savior. God is love. God loves you. And you know that life is truly meaningless. And you go, you know the circle and the cycle that you go through. And after a while, after 70, 80 years, the chapter closes and you die and you're forgotten. But God does not want to forget you. God wants to put your name in the palm of His hand. You need to come and trust God. You need to come and trust God through Jesus Christ. God loves you and He sent Jesus for you to bring you to that reality with Him. And so, I want you to pray alongside with me. As I pray for you, I want you to say, You know God, I want this to be me. I don't want to live this meaningless life, this cycle again and again. This circle that seems to come back to square one. Give me meaning and give me purpose. Close your eyes and join me in prayer. God, you are a God who loves us. That's what your word tells us. And you love us because you sent Jesus, your son, to die. For my friends who join me in prayer now, I ask you, God to speak to their hearts. Begin to work in their hearts, O oh Lord, a yearning that they know, uh, that void that can only, can only be satisfied by you. So that they too can get out of this meaningless life and have purpose and eternal life in you. Holy Spirit, come alongside them and give revelation, bring people to bring revelation of Christ who is love from God. Amen. And so my friends, my brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace now and evermore. Thank you.